And I think we are live. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Sounds great. Okay, sounds good. All right, well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our webinar. Tonight, we are going to discuss Medicare for All, Web Primer for 2018 candidates. Uh, my name is Corey Archibald. I am the Communications Director for Brand New Congress. And I know we do have a lot of BNC candidates on the call. However, we have a, a pretty good mix tonight. So just for the rest of you who aren't familiar with BNC, I just want to give a quick introduction. Brand New Congress is a post-partisan movement to fix Congress by electing grassroots candidates, both Democrats, Republicans. These are people that are going to be working together outside of party lines to rebuild our economy and restore the American dream. You can learn more about our plan to implement Medicare for All, which is one of our signature um, policy planks, as well as everything else on our platform if you go check out brandnewcongress.org. And I know uh, I'm really glad to see that we have a good mix of candidates here. We also have a lot of advocates on the call. We have campaign staffers. We have volunteers on the call. This is a really good opportunity for us to expand our knowledge base on what we believe or what certainly what I believe is going to be the central issue of the 2018 campaign. I really want to thank Physicians for National Health Program who approached us about sponsoring this webinar. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with PNHP, they are a 30-year-old nonprofit research and education organization with more than 21,000 members made up of physicians, medical students, health professionals, people who support people within the industry who support single-payer national health insurance. Now, this webinar is going to focus a little bit more on the uh, the economic case, uh, specifically how do we talk about how do we talk to conservatives and moderates about this progressive policy? I know that a lot of you had uh, submitted questions in advance about the mechanics of the plan, how is it actually going to work, and we're going to cover those to the extent that we can over the next 75 minutes. Um, but I would also encourage you after this webinar to check out pnhp.org, and that's where you can actually read their plan in detail and get answers to a lot of those kinds of questions about how it's actually going to function. They've got a, just a ton of excellent information there. Uh, really, PNHP is the premier organization for progressive healthcare policy, and we're just very fortunate to have this opportunity with them. Now, our presenter this evening is Dr. Ed Weisbart, uh, a man who's really seen and worked in every angle of the American healthcare system. Uh, first, of course, as a healthcare provider, Dr. Weisbart practiced family medicine at Rush Medical Center in Chicago for 20 years. Uh, later, from the business side of the house, he served as chief medical officer for Express Scripts from 2003 to 2010. And today, coming from the policy, education, advocacy side of healthcare, Dr. Weisbart serves as chair of the Missouri chapter of PNHP, as well as the assistant professor of clinical medicine at Washington University in St. Louis. And he's also vice president of the Consumers Council of Missouri. And because all that doesn't keep him busy enough, he also generously volunteers in a variety of safety net clinics or, and just other nonprofits around the St. Louis area. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Weisbart with us today, and I'm going to stop talking and hand him the reins. <laughs> Dr. Weisbart, the floor is yours. Great. Hey, thanks, Corey. I appreciate it. So I'm delighted to have a chance to talk to you all about this topic. Um, it's been an evolving passion of mine for many years, and uh, I, I think you'll, I, I'm glad to be able to share some of these, this information with you. Um, so we're going to talk about this in, in basically three phases. First, we'll um, try to review some of the basic information about Medicare for All, what it is, how it works, um, some, some of the basics of it so we have a level playing field about it. But then uh, I think the most important part of the discussion isn't going to be the nuts and bolts of Medicare for All, but rather the lesson about how to talk about Medicare for All. And I imagine many of you aren't as completely obsessed with healthcare as I am, and you're probably working on other progressive issues as well. Um, so. I'm healthcare focused. I'm a physician, as you know, so I'll be using Medicare for all as the example, but hopefully the lessons will be broader than just about, about healthcare even. The middle section of this will be going through a few models, basically, of how conservatives and liberals think similarly and differently. And then on the back uh, section of this, we'll go through sort of a, a demonstration about how to talk to Medicare about Medicare for all, applying the principles that, uh, that I just mentioned. And that part, I'll be sort of stepping in and out of character um, to unpack some of the, the things. So the way I got involved in this whole topic was my background starting as a, as a family physician uh, in Chicago um, for 20 years or so, a large urban academic center. And for these decades, I was surrounded by people who thought more or less the same as I did, generally 
um, progressives in general, not complete, but but um, we had this cartoon in our heads of who conservatives were. There was there were these folks who lived someplace else. They they were we stereotyped them as as being either less informed or or just um, ignorant or uninterested. Certainly less generous. Certainly cold hearted. That was the cartoon that we had about those crazy those crazy conservatives. And then I moved to Missouri, <laughs> and the world's a little bit different here actually. So I moved here to be, as you heard, to be chief medical officer um, at Express Scripts. And, and as you'll see, I am absolutely not speaking on behalf of Express Scripts at the moment. I retired from that in 2010. And when I was working at Express Scripts, I found myself um, embedded in, in a sea of really conservative folks, far more conservative than, than in general, with some very noted exceptions. But most of the people there were far more conservative than I had ever you know, lived amongst. Um, and I was confronted with the fact that this cartoon that I brought with my, who I brought with when I went there, did not apply. <laughs> a lot of these, most of these conservative folks that I was with, were actually incredibly smart, incredibly decent, caring, better informed than I was, uh, than I am. They they often know far more history than I do, um, and they're personally often very generous. They they tithe, so many of them tithe, many of them volunteer, uh, and and give you know time and money of their own at a higher level than I was doing at the, at the time. So I had a, I really struggled to reconcile that with my preconceived um, ideas. And I'll explain how I started to get past that a little later on. Um, and then after I retired from that, as you heard, I organized the Missouri chapter of, of uh, Physicians for a National Health Program. So uh, we now reach, oh, I should update that slide. We now reach about 3,000 people across Missouri. So here's some basic stuff. These countries that are scrolling up slowly here, those all live longer than, than we do. They have longer life expectancies than we do. Um, so some of my slides have a lot of countries across. Yes. I'm so sorry to jump in, but I don't think we're seeing your screen. Well, that's not good. <laughs> let's jump hey, back. Well, let's, uh, your again. Okay. I, thought, I thought you were uh, just giving a nice, generous introduction. I apologize. I didn't realize that you were trying to screen share right then. There we go. OK, let's go. Now we're ready. <laughs> Oh, sorry about that. Sorry if I can't get to the, the button that I need to get to. There we go. Hey. Okay. There we well, go. There you go. Those countries, is, I'll bet you can tell, those countries live longer than we do. So thanks for interrupting. That's a, that's, that's good. Okay. So some of my slides, there'll be so many countries across the horizontal axis that they're in a smaller font. Some won't have, some will have fewer. It's not because I'm cherry picking the data. It's because they come from different sources, of course. So this one has a, has quite a few. Uh, I've tried to always make the United States be one that's a slightly different color. So in this, in most of them, I think it'll be, we're the red country against the green sea of others. Um, you'll also see in the bottom left corner of most of my slides, if there's numbers or anything of that sort, uh, there will be a footnote. So you'll have direct access to the source of data. Anyway, these countries all live longer than we do. Um, I'm not going to belabor that. You knew that, but I wanted to point it out because we're going to come back to it uh, a little bit later and show you some things about this that are actually really good news, not just the bad news that you're seeing there. And then, of course, um, you know, we have the most expensive. Hello? Sorry, Ed. One, one more second. I just wanted to double check to make sure that everyone is able to see uh, Ed's screen. Okay. Yep, I got it. I, got it. I, I, I can see it. Yes. Good. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Okay, so this this is you know sort of the standard data that shows you that we we spend roughly double um, any other modern nation. You knew that, and again, we're going to come back to that in a bit. The question really is, why is it so expensive? Where does uh, our money all go? Is it because we're running to doctors all the time? Americans, you know, we all know people who go to the doctor every couple of days, right? Is that what it is? That it is all the is, is, is it that we're overusing physician services? Well, there we are actually um, near the bottom of how often we go. Most modern nations go to uh, get see their physician far more often than we do in the United States. Uh, we don't even actually have that many physicians per, per, per thousand um, per, per population our size compared to most other modern nations. So that, that's not it. But we lead the world at this. We lead the world at this. So... This, you know, is actually pretty expensive to have this many of folks doing this. Um, and if you do the arithmetic, which I have, and add up the number of people working in billings and accounts receivable for hospitals, and compare that to the number of beds there are in hospitals, 
It turns out that there are actually more people in the United States working for hospitals in billings and accounts receivable than there are beds in hospitals across the country. So the average country, the average hospital in the United States could afford today to put somebody from Billings full time at the foot of every bed and have an entire department left over, have an entire department left over. They can't do that with nurses. They can't do that with physicians. They can't do that with social workers or pharmacists, but they could put a person from billing full time at every bed. And that's incredibly expensive. They're not, you know, they're helping to manage the system that we've built, but they're not actually doing anything to improve healthcare. So, so that's one part of the problem. Another part of the problem, of course, is that our prices are crazy high. So here's a smattering of almost random drugs, and we're the green bar for we're the red bar for pricing, and the other countries are the green bars for pricing. And you can see that you know this isn't news to you. Everybody kind of knows that. And it's not just in pharmacy. Our prices are crazy high, and and all these other things. So look, for example, to the right, um, the typical delivery, a normal delivery in the United States. Um, costs $10,000. And in Spain, it costs $2,200. And in most other modern nations, it's in the $2,000 range. So there are actually American women overseas who find who don't have insurance, find that they're pregnant, and decide that it's cheaper for them to stay in this other country in a, in, in a premium hotel for the next several months, deliver, and then fly first class back to the United States and they actually do that for less money than if they had had to pay retail for a delivery in the United States. And that's just, that's just unacceptable that that's the case. So why do we spend so much? We spend so much because we've made this incredibly complex system and because the prices here are, the prices are too high, basically. So how do we solve this? And I'm here to tell you that the solution to this is actually, I believe, a free market solution. Medicare for all, in my mind, is a free market solution. So let me explain what I mean by that. What I mean by that. First, how is healthcare arranged around the world? And this will be a very simplified version of it because for time reasons, but there's one almost extreme way that you could set it up, a national health service. And that's actually not what we're talking about tonight. So this is where the government actually provides the service. It owns the buildings, it owns the hospitals, it owns the brick and mortar clinics. It directly employs the physicians and nurses and, and everybody. That is actually the definition, as I understand it, of, of socialism. Socialism, as I recall, is when the government owns the means of production. So this is socialized medicine. It exists. It's a real thing. It's in Great Britain and a few other countries. Um, it's the way they do it in the Veterans Administration. Um, and I'm not saying that it's good or bad. It actually works quite well in many cases. But that's not my point. My point is that it is an extreme way to set it up, to set up healthcare finance. And I call it extreme because there is no further involvement in healthcare that you could give to the government. There is no further involvement that you could do. So it's as far as you can go, and therefore I call that an extreme way to set up healthcare. But on the other side of the equation, there's another extreme version. That's, I won't belabor it, but that's the way we have it um, here. And I call our system extreme because we're literally the only country in the modern world that does this. And when you're the only one in the world doing something, Sorry, that's extreme. And I'm painting it like this because there's what I consider a conservative model right in the middle. And this is where we just talk about the insurance side. We're not talking about changing the way healthcare is delivered, although that's another discussion that's definitely worth having. All we're talking about tonight, all that we're talking about with Medicare for all is the insurance side of it. So this is publicly funded, right? You pay your taxes and then the government acts essentially as an escrow agent and pays for the services but it's delivered privately. Physicians can be you know, on the corner in a small group like they, like they want to, or in a large group, or, or they can be employed, or they can work for the government if they choose to do a setting like that. Basically a plethora of delivery systems, but publicly funded. That's exactly what Medicare is, right? Medicare is tax funded primarily, um, and then privately delivered. That's how Canada does it in a few other countries. So this, if you think about it, actually unfetters physicians and helps us compete with each other for your services, right? This makes physicians competing to, to attract patients rather than today where physicians are competing to attract the most lucrative insurance uh, plan. Today, my primary or physicians are very focused on optimizing their payer mix because 
all of the insurance companies pay us a different amount for the same exact service. And we're working retail, so we have to figure that out. So this would say physicians can refocus the, 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 um, the, the free market pressures that they're under onto delivering the best care and attracting the best patients or attracting the most patients, doing the medicine, having the free market apply to actually medicine rather than having us focused on, on the payer mix. So that's why I think it's actually a free market solution and, and quite conservative because it's such a competitive model. As you know, there's a bill in the House, uh, HR 676, which we'll go through in some detail that would accomplish this. And it's very similar to the newer legislation um, in the Senate. And we'll talk about that a little bit too. So let's, uh, let's talk about this, HR 676. It's the bill that was introduced by John Conyers in uh, 2003 and has but we'll talk about the co-sponsors in a little bit later. And you should read it. H.R. 676 is 30 pages. It's double-spaced. It's big font. It's easy to read. Give yourself an hour or two. Google H.R. 676. It'll come up. You can read it in an hour or two. And you'll know more than you, than, than you, than you, it'll answer most of the questions in your head. It's only 30 pages. It'll never pass the way it's written, right? It'll, by the, when it starts moving through committees, it'll be amended, it'll be edited, it'll become more complicated operationally, but it's perfect to read through the way it is today because it is shorter and you can't, and what you can get from it is a strate, an answer to the strategic problems, most of the strategic problems that you'd be thinking of. So it's really a perfect time to read HR 676 before it gets um, expanded upon. So it only says two things really. It says improve Medicare and expand Medicare. Improve Medicare. Um, we know Medicare is far from perfect. It's great, but it's far from perfect. In particular, Medicare has gaps in the benefit design. It doesn't cover, Medicare doesn't cover dentistry or, or hearing aids or glasses or, or nutritionist or a range of things. So there are gaps in the benefit design. This would improve it. This would plug the gaps in the benefit design. Medicare today also has pretty significant financial barriers to care. It has pretty significant deductibles and co-pays and an 80-20 mix on part A. It's got, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't eliminate the financial barriers to care and actually preserves them. So we know that's a problem. Most seniors who can afford to solve that problem will improve Medicare on their own. So about a third of seniors today buy a supplement, which basically fixes some of these problems, or they switch to an advantage program, which also in some ways fixes the program. And there's challenges with both of those strategies that are beyond the scope for tonight. But basically, basically we know from what the market has asked for that there are problems with Medicare and we know how to fix them. So improve Medicare. Those are the two things we mean when we say improved Medicare. We mean fix the benefit gaps and eliminate the financial barriers to care. And then expand it. Give it to everybody. Give it to Congress. Give it Give it to everybody in office. Give it to teachers. Give it to kids. Give it to give it to um, everybody you can think of. All Americans in this. And of course, if everybody is in this, that then is the largest risk pool you can have, which is ideal for an insurance product. But even more importantly, if everybody were in this program, then a legislator who tried to damage it would come under fire because they would be damaging the insurance for their family members, their own family members, no private programs outside of it. They'd be damaging the insurance for their own family members. They'd be damaging the insurance for all of their constituents. So the best way to protect Medicare is to have everybody in it. And then it's the most stable program that you can want. Also, if you have everybody in it, that greatly simplifies the amount of administrative noise that we have, the expense of running this complicated system we have that, that is dramatically reduced when you, when you do this. So the, the only way to really um, fund what we're talking about, and we'll do more detail about that in a few minutes, the only way to really fund that is indeed to have everybody in it for the administrative savings. And if you did that, then we would no longer need to have these arcane fights about, well, my, my state expanded Medicaid. Well, my state didn't expand Medicaid. People are actually moving across state boundaries to get into a state that has more robust health care. And that's crazy. Why should, why should you have to change your state based on that? So, so it also happens that Medicare for all would be terrific for, for labor, for, for workers. So it's very stimulative to the economy. There's businesses today typically describe health care as a ball and chain around their ankle that keeps them from being able to the cost of healthcare that keeps them, that makes them lose when they try to compete in the global market. So this would be very stimulative to business building better jobs. You know, we know that wages have been very flat in part because of the uncontrollably rapid increases in cost of healthcare 
employers have had a hard time making wages keep up with the rate they want. So it would be much better for jobs. And and the bill has more pragmatic uh, steps in it as well. Um, it protects anybody whose job is displaced by this. So, of course, there's an emphasis in the bill on retraining and job placement and also income guarantee for up to $100,000 per year for two years if you're displaced by this. But more importantly, you have to bear in mind these are most of the jobs. Some, some jobs that would be impacted by this are terrific jobs with, with folks who, who love their work. But most of the jobs are data entry or call center and, and are what I'm going to frankly call crummy jobs. And I'm calling them crummy jobs not as a value judgment, but I call them crummy because these jobs have a 25% annual turnover in general. It's 25%. So that means no matter what you do today, two years from now, more than half of the people that we're talking about aren't going to be in those jobs anyway. So the, the, job, the job isn't a great job to start with. If it does get displaced, you have income guarantee, and then the rest of the economy would be in need for, of, of, of more people as, this, as the economy is stimulated. And of course, you could get unemployment if you needed to. So what does the Senate bill look like? And the Senate bill looks a lot like the House bill, only it's three times as long. Um, but overall design is very similar. It, it covers all the kinds of things that you would think it would cover, just like the other does. But it, it's very specific about calling out it covers full reproductive health care, and it does it in a way that most folks think would, would, not, would not make it subject to the Hyde Amendment. So full reproductive care, and I hope you understand what I mean there. Um, it also would, increase, would empower Medicare to negotiate the prices of drugs and devices. It would, as the other bill does, eliminate all copays and deductibles, except for up to $200 a year of a copay for pharmacy. So it does have a little bit of that. And like the other bill, it prohibits the sale of insurance that duplicates what's in this core offering. Immediately, upon the bill passing, immediately it would plug some of these benefit gaps. Immediately, it would add dental, vision, and hearing to current Medicare members. Immediately, it would, start, it would put a limit on out-of-pocket costs for Part A and Part B and eliminate deductibles. So, you know, that's, that's a big part of why people are buying supplements is because, of, because there's really no limit on those uh, today. If you, one of the, the most common way to get into Medicare is by your age, of course, but uh, if you're disabled, fully disabled, you can also get covered through Medicare, but you have to wait two years. Why do you have to wait two years? You know, if, you, if you're fully disabled to the point that you actually need to have Medicare, it can be lethal to have to wait two years. So, that, so one of the other immediate improvements is that um, the bill immediately eliminates that. And it also puts, you could think of it as a, as, as a, as a, public, uh, a public option. It immediately adds to all of the marketplaces around the country what, uh, what, their, what the bill calls a Medicare transition plan on all of the marketplace exchanges competing with all of the other products. So, so this is not exactly Medicare. They call it a Medicare transition plan. You'd be purchasing into a plan that's close to Medicare. It has a 90% a actuarial value instead of a much higher rate that you get with Medicare. So that would be immediately available to anybody who's purchasing on the exchanges. That's all immediate. But the, the, to me, the most important difference between the House bill and Sanders, and, and Sanders bill in the Senate is that it addresses what, for me, has frankly been my biggest worry about the bill <clears throat> in the House, which is the bill in the House um, has you uh, immediately throw, two years after passage, you throw a switch, and everybody in the country switches from whatever insurance they have today. The House bill says immediately on that specific day, everybody goes into Medicare. And I don't care how clever we are, I don't care how smart we are, I don't care how well we've modeled it out, there are going to be unintended consequences. And that particular thing of abruptly changing one sixth of the country's economy has frankly always had me worried. So Sanders doesn't do that. San, uh, the, the Senate bill has a four year implementation program. So when I first saw that, I, you know, part of me was happy as I just said, and then I thought, well, you know, was, was happy about that. And then I thought, oh, come on, we can't wait four years. But then I realized Teddy Roosevelt campaigned on essentially Medicare for all. So we've been having this fight for more than 100 years. I think we can handle a four-year transition program. So what does this implementation process look like? Well, first, um, if you're 55 or older, you would be able to purchase Medicare. You wouldn't be given Medicare, but if you're 55 or older, you'd be able to purchase Medicare um, at the appropriate, appropriate fee. And then on year two, at age 45, could purchase it, age, age three, or year three, uh, 35 and older, and then at year four, it would go, it would go wide. Um, and 
the other programs, Part C and Part D, would remain options until the end of the four-year implementation program. So how do you fund it? So on first pass, this is very disturbing. The Senate bill has is completely silent about how to fund this program. And I'm going to walk through economics for you. Trust me, it's important to me. But the Senate bill is completely silent on it. And I thought, when I first saw that, I thought, oh, my God, you know, us liberals, here we are not even talking about how to pay for it. And But then I realized that the minute that he literally, I think the minute that the bill was released, there was also a, a beautiful six page white paper running through a series of options for how we could fund it with some economic breakdown of, of several strategies. So the bill was intentionally not drawing a line in the sand and saying this is the answer. The bill was saying, here's a range of ways we could fund this. We should have a national discussion about that. So what are those ways? What do those, those ways look like? Well, the first one that I want to unpack a little bit, the others I won't really, is you could tax employers. Oh my God, I just said you could tax employers. Yes, this one way that you could fund this is a 7.5% tax or pre income based premium on employers. And it turns out if you did that, that would raise almost $4 trillion. And, but businesses, despite having this new tax, would save almost would save about $9,000 per employee. How does that work? How can you get a tax and save money? Well, if you look at it, the arithmetic is that in 2016, an employee who made $50,000 a year and had a family of four, across the country on average, the, that employer was paying nearly $13,000 in premiums that year. So compare that $13,000 in premiums with the 7.5% tax, which is $37.50. In other words, yes, you could absorb the 7.5% tax as an employer and save more than $9,000 per employee. So that's one way that you could fund it. You could change the, t the amount of the tax. You could change the savings. You know, you could play with these numbers and come up with whatever we choose to come up with. Or you could put an income-based premium on households rather than taxing the employers or partially taxing. You could, you could fund it through, through households, and that would also raise, raise quite a bit of money. Under this, under this scheme, the typical middle-class family saves more than $4,000. They would have a tax, but since there'd be no premium, no copay, none of those other things, their savings would be far bigger than the cost and to the point of $4,400 for the typical family. And I'm not going to walk through all the others because there are actually other options. Um, and, and it's, it's, those are things we could discuss. Those are decisions that we would make. Budgets reflect our values, and that would be something we would have to go through. So there's a range of options. And I think the best way to think of that is one of the bill's co-sponsors, uh, Senator Harris, uh, who said this, and I'm just going to read it, that there needs to be, that she said this as soon, when, the, when it came out as a co-sponsor. She said there needs to be a vigorous debate as to the best way to finance our Medicare for all legislation. Under each and every one of these options in the white paper that I mentioned, the average American family will end up in a better financial position than they are today. So that's the point, is that there's a way, there, there are ways to fund it, and they're all better. So let's talk about a, one, one of the proof points about this, both economically and from a health perspective. You may not have realized this, but in 1971, the United States and Canada, remember we're talking about a system very similar to Canada's, although we're Americans, we could do it better than they do, but 1971, our, our healthcare systems were performing almost the same. We were spending the same percentage of GDP and we had almost the same life expectancies. And this is very important to understand because when you talk about this, people will say, well, Canada, that's Canada, you can't apply things, it's a bigger country, it's this or it's that. Well, then why were we the same? And then in 1973, Ron Nixon signed into law the HMO Act and, and Canada fully implemented their national health insurance. So we were the same and, and different. So here's our trend on cost. Relentless curve, you know, now almost 19%. You can't see any real impact on cost as a percentage of GDP from the HMO Act being passed. And then here's Canada's program. Canada put in their program and our paths diverged so that now they spend half of what we spend. I'm gonna skip through this for, actually, no, I'm not gonna skip through this. So um, we have, more people with unmet health care needs than Canadians do. And most Americans who have an unmet health care need have it because of cost and, and a variety of other things. Canadians have an unmet health care need primarily because of waiting lists. And you have to understand this and a little bit because of costs and other things. So, yes, it's true. There's a waiting list for patients in Canada. Every Canadian has a story about how they didn't like the waiting list. But they'll say in their next breath that 
they know that if they got leukemia, they wouldn't have to have a bake sale, a bake sale. So they think it's the right decision. So what is the waiting list like in Canada? First of all, they have it because they spend half. Um, second, what does it really look like? If you ask Americans, we have this sense that 80% of the Canadians wait two years for something. You know, we have the sense that it's dreadful. So how long are these waiting lists? How long are they actually? In Canada, the knee replacement is pretty long. Hip replacement, again, more than three months. Cataract surgery, two months. Prostate surgery, um, angioplasty, if you have a blocked artery, the balloon process, and, and bypass surgery. And that's not for the emergent, the emergent ones, it's for the others. So that's the data for Canada. How about in the United States? Here's the data for the United States. Oh, wait, we don't have any data like that in the United States. We don't even know that kind of data. We can't get that kind of data. So when you add it up in Canada, 80% of, Can of Canadians wait less than four months for elective surgery. And in the United States, that data isn't available. And then life expectancy, back as old as this data set goes in 1979, Canadians were living a year, one year longer than we were. And then over the last, whatever period of time that is, Canadians now live almost three years longer than we do. So at the end of the day, they spend half, they have less unmet health care needs and they live much longer. So that's the basics. Let's, let's do some thinking about how people think about this stuff though. So first off, um, this is, um, striking about how subtle differences in words can make a huge difference in results. So this was a survey of likely voters. So the numbers are higher than you would ordinarily think, but this is likely voters in 2008. And they asked them one of two questions. Half of them were asked, how important is it to you to vote? The other half were asked, how important is it to you to be a voter? And then they went, that's the only difference. No difference almost. And then they went back a few days later and found out, did you vote? And the first group, 82%, the second group, 96%. Now, my message here isn't about the words of this and the content. My message is a fairly trivial difference in the way you say things can make a big difference in what actually happens. So we have these words, Medicare for all, single payer, national health insurance. What are they? Well, let's explain this. On the left, there's all of us in America, and on the right, there's all the stuff that we want, doctors, nurses, hospitals, pharmacies, and in between the two, of course, is the money, and the money is managed by the U.S. government for the military and for Medicare and such, that's managed by states, it's managed by cities and schools, it's managed by businesses, it's managed by a wealth of insurance companies, that's called a multiple, we have a multitude of payers, and so this is called a multi-payer system, and it's very expensive, as I'll show you. You could replace this multi-payer model that we have with just a, guess what, a single-payer model. So now you know what a payer is. You may not have known what a payer was one minute ago, but now you know what a payer is, a single-payer model. So the government would act as an escrow account and just pay things that we want. You could call it a single-payer model. You could call that national health insurance. You could call that Medicare for all. So which words do you use? Well, single payer, a lot of folks don't know what a payer is. So that's a tricky one to use. Um, national health insurance, I promise you, don't use the phrase national health insurance in Missouri. <laughs> they, that does not resonate here. And if you're trying to reach to the conservative folks, uh, that's, that's potentially a very scary phrase to folks. Uh, Medicare for all, well, you gotta be careful there too, because Medicare for some people are very aware of the problems with Medicare. So you could say improved Medicare for all, that's too many words, frankly. So I, and most people don't focus on the problems that Medicare has, which we just did. So I usually just use the phrase Medicare for all. And if somebody pushes back and says, well, there's this problem or that problem, I then quickly say, well, yeah, you know, you're right. I should have said improved Medicare for all. And I've never had anybody push um, further than that. So it turns out that there's data about this. Americans uh, support socialized medicine as a set of words more than I thought they would, but they do. More than a third of Americans um, support that concept. Um, more than that, support single payer. But there's still well under half. Um, guaranteed universal coverage, um, again, more popular. But the phrase that's more ubiquitously popular is the phrase Medicare for all. There's data. This is for a population. It's not necessarily for a specific group that you're talking to, but in general, you know, think about that, and that, that's probably the group. So we're going to play a pretend game. We're changing the subject to another model here. We're going to toss a coin. Heads, you lose $10. Tails, I pay you something. Get it? Heads, you lose $10. You pay me $10. Heads comes up. Tails, I pay you something. So the question is, 
for you to actually say, I'm going to play, how much does tails have to be worth? So get it, heads, you lose $10, tails, you gain something. How big does something have to be for you to say, yes, I want to play? And obviously, I can't hear from you all, but, but the typical answer is $20. So most people, losses are twice as important as gains. Why am I telling you this? We often speak in gain-centric messages, and I submit that those are less compelling than a loss-centric message, gain-centric message. With Medicare for all, you can save money for the other things that you want. Nice. Loss-centric message. Stop wasting your money. <laughs> Stop wasting your money. A gain-centric message. See any doctor you want. A loss-centric message. Why should insurance companies tell you what doctor you can see? A gain-centric message. Live longer and healthier. A loss-centric message. Don't die younger than you have to. A little bit scarier. Don't scare people. But loss-centric messages are more motivating. This is another model from a guy named Manny Elkind, and uh, he says people have one of four ways of thinking, a comfort zone. And actually, of course, we all have all four, but we're more comfortable in one of these four, each of us individually. So there's a group of people who, for whom facts are the important thing. They want to know the numbers. They, want, they have to have numbers and efficiency and metrics, or they don't believe what you're talking about. If you can't measure it, I don't believe it. Then there's people who, for whom that's less important than the forms. How are you going to do it? What's the method? How is this actually going to work? Or there's a group of people that have to know where we're going. What's the future? What, why are we doing all this? Where are you taking me? Then there's another group of people for whom it's all about feelings. If I don't have a human face on this thing that you're telling me about, I'm not interested. So the point is, if you reflect on yourself, you'll probably find that you're more comfortable in one of these quadrants than the other. But you have to be comfortable speaking in all four quadrants. If you're talking to, and so you have, you have to, you have to do that. If you're speaking to a large group, you need to actually be able to rotate amongst these four quadrants on a regular basis, or you'll be, or people will be dropping out. When you're talking to an individual, the strategy, of course, is to listen and figure out where they're coming from. So, how does this work for healthcare? What do these four quadrants look for for healthcare? We have no shortage of facts. We have no shortage of facts. Um, Forms, you could talk about, about, about the bills. You could talk about a variety of ways of how you could do it or some of the operational details. The future, where are we going? Well, obviously, we're going to try to make our country more competitive and healthier, perhaps. Uh, feelings, anecdotes, you know, uh, stories, human faces. And we'll get more specific about that a little bit later. But the point is, listen to who you're talking to. And if you're talking to somebody who's raising a challenge about about a human story. They're telling you about their uncle who was in Canada and had such and such happen, and you respond with life expectancy to statistics, you're speaking outside of their comfort zone and they can't hear you. They can't hear you. So if somebody starts with a, with a personal story, you've got to respond in some way that acknowledges and respects that personal story and maybe, to maybe tell something about that too. Or if they're saying we can't afford it, then you don't answer that we can't afford it with an anecdote about human suffering. They're again, not going to hear you. So think about what quadrant people are in. George Lakoff, you probably are familiar with him. If you're not, um, get familiar with, with, with some of his writings. Uh, and this is sort of his, his treatise in my mind, Moral Politics. This is the book I stumbled on when I was um, working at Express Scripts that helped me better understand uh, some of these folks that I had trouble understanding. So he says that there's two cognitive models. He says that there's a nurturant mother, his words, and a strict father, and that depending on how you were brought up, one of these two models is dominant in your head. So a nurturant mother, this is somebody who's focused on equality and on diversity, helping hands, you know, basically this is a liberal. <laughs> and strict fathers uh, are somebody for whom there's a hierarchy in their head. There's a natural order to things, and your place in the natural order is the consequence of your morality, of your personal moral your personal morality. So if you did something to disrupt that hierarchy, maybe you would be helping the person giving them a hand up, but that would be so disruptive to the, to the fabric of society that you're going to actually cause the collapse of civilization by disrupting the hierarchy. I've had people say it almost in those words to me. So it sounds to liberals, that sounds almost like a joke, but it is not a joke. Um, they really believe it. That's basically social Darwinism, right? Um, they believe in consequences. And this is, in other words, conservatives. The important part of this is that in the middle, there's these folks that have both of these frames in their head. Both frames are active. They look to us like they're undecided, and we call them independents, right? So it turns out, according to Lakoff, that 20% of Americans only have the nurturant mother model in their head. 
20% only have the strict father, and most people actually have both frames. How do you use this? I'll show you how I would use it. This is how I do use it. So if you're talking to somebody who you identify as liberal, see if there's information you need to you know, give, that's fine. But then if somebody's already there with you, try to move them over to action and a commitment. If somebody's uh, conservative, don't just walk away. Um, there's things that we're trying to do that actually resonate strongly with conservative values. We're just not usually comfortable talking to them. So these are some of the things that are really important to conservatives that align well with what we're talking about. So for example, you could bring up that insurance insurers limit your choice of doctors and hospitals. Again, loss aversion and some other moral values. Uh, you can decide, you know, well, I don't want you to tell me when I got to go to get to the doctor, get care. No, you can decide not to get care, but you should not die because you can't afford care. Um, it's just, if you find somebody who's willing to say, let them die, and really means that, well, that person you can walk away from because you're never going to get through to them. So, uh, and there are a few of those folks, but most people agree that Medicare should cover things like dialysis or that we should pay for, most, most people are not comfortable with that. So if you're, if you're going to give people Medicare, if they have dialysis, which costs something on the order of $75,000 a year, that's fine, that's good, but I would like to do that in the most prudent way I can, and that means I'd rather buy the, buy the diabetic a bottle of insulin every month. I'd rather buy the high blood pressure pills every month and delay the dialysis by a few years or forever. So if I'm gonna give them, if I'm gonna give them dialysis when they, when, they, when they need it, I'd rather do the cheapest thing and, and prevent their need for that. So this group, I mean, the, indep the independence, what you want to do is help them get to the point of agreeing with you and that's where you wanna tell an anecdote. Because this, if you have the right anecdote, that can activate the nurturing frame in the independence point of view. So that's where anecdotes, I think, are the most important is on independence. Then I think of this as Lakoff 2.0, although it's got nothing to do with Lakoff, but I think it does in some ways. Now, Jonathan Haidt's work, The Righteous Mind, I really recommend this book. It's an online survey of 130,000 Americans, and he found these five moral values, and he compares that with where people stand politically. So he says there's five moral pillars. He says altruism, justice, rights, that's a fairness value. He says caring is a, is a moral pillar. Loyalty is a moral pillar. Authority and sanctity, these are moral pillars. And, and you can read that there's a lot more granularity there. And then he compares where liberals and conservatives stand. And it turns out, according to his surveys, liberals score very high on fair, fairness and caring, and not so high on these other moral pillars. And then conservatives also value fairness and caring but less so than liberals do, but then they score these other moral pillars quite high. So if you're over here, from the liberal point of view, looking at the conservatives, you think, oh, those heartless bastards. But if you're a conservative looking at liberals, you think your lack of moral values is gonna destroy our society. Both sides believe they hold the moral high ground. So how do you do that for cover everybody? Well, that's the healthcare is a human right, protect the vulnerable. These two arguments, healthcare as a human right, will not resonate with arch conservatives. They just won't. So when we do that, we're hitting radioactive buttons because we're implying that we ignore their other moral pillars. So we love to put up graphics like this all over the place because it makes us rail against the unfairness. This will never persuade a conservative. So instead, loyalty. Temper things about poor outcomes with reasons for national pride, and I'll show you how to do that. Authority is easy to tap into if we, if we just try. And sanctity, it's a violation of our stewardship. So, so let's try this out. How do we build our, so why, why build it on Medicare? So first reason why building on Medicare is Medicare means Americans get healthier. This is a very wonky slide and I apologize, I don't know how to do this in a non-wonky way. But you already know that our life expectancies are not the best in the modern world. So here they are with our life expectancy at a given age compared to 17 other peer nations. So you can see 10 year olds against 17 other peer nations. You can see on the right, like a 92 year old American remaining projected life expectancy compared to remaining projected life expectancy of 92 year olds in Italy or France or Sweden or 17 other nations. So this part you knew, right? There we are at the bottom. And this is again, the very disruptive to somebody who's, who cherishes loyalty and patriotism to tell them that we suck like this, that's very disruptive to their head and they have a hard time listening to you. So you should very quickly go to this side of the slide. 
There's something amazing that happens once we turn 65. Our seniors, this is according to the Institute of Medicine, our seniors have longer remaining life expectancies than they do in most other modern nations. Medicare, you could think of as a crown jewel of the country. Expanding it is good business sense. We can recover. The reason we can recover on the right side is because we have the world's best doctors in hospitals that you can find. You can't recover like that if you don't have that. But bear in mind, recovering from decades of neglect, that's really expensive. So the problem isn't that we don't have good health care delivery. The problem is we don't let everybody in. So we're choosing the most expensive way to do this. Medicare means stop wasting our money on bureaucracy. You've probably seen this. The overhead for insurance companies is 15 to 20%, and traditional Medicare, according to the Medicare Trust Fund report, is less than 2%. It goes up a bit if you add in Part C and Part D, and we can talk more about that if you like. Um, partially because Medicare doesn't do ads like this. Those ads are only for private insurance. They're not for Medicare. Medicare has no reason to advertise. And there's lots of other things that Medicare doesn't have to do. It doesn't have to do marketing. It doesn't have to have all these sales teams. All of these things are line items in private insurance and virtually non-existent for Medicare. And that's why Medicare's overhead is so much cheaper. Notice that I framed that as stop wasting money. I didn't frame it as, as a gain. I tried to frame that as stop wasting, loss aversion. So Medicare turns out to make economic sense. There have been literally, I've counted them, there are 25 studies at the state and federal level that show that the savings would either break even or provide or, or more than pay for full coverage. I'm going to walk through two of them, through one of them with you here. So this is from Professor Gerald Friedman. He at the time was the chair of the Department of, of, the Department of Economics at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. I got it all out. Good. And he said, yes, of course, there would be new costs, but there would be bigger new savings. And it's really important to understand this. So the new costs, Medicare pays far less than any other insurance does in, in most parts of the country. And as a consequence, a lot of physicians don't take Medicaid patients and physicians have to assess what you're worth to, uh, to what patients are worth to us economically. So pay more for Medicaid patients. And that would cost the country about that much, according to Professor Friedman. Paying for the uninsured, of course, would add a cost and increase. The, everybody would start doing stuff. They'd go to the dentist and they do stuff. Now, some studies last last fall stopped at this point and said, "Of course, we'd love Medicare for all. It sounds great, but how are we supposed to come up with this three hundred billion dollars a year or whatever number they 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 pick?" That's just not fair. You have to look at the other side of the balance sheet. We can disagree about philosophy and policy and tactics and strategies and all that, but we we really have to have the facts straight. And so what are the facts? So on the other side of the equation, there are some savings from having the government administer one program instead of, you know, dozens of programs. It's a small number because of the lower overhead. Um, you would save on health insurance administration, of course, in the way that we talked about from a jobs perspective. Um, administration of costs to providers, hospitals and physicians. The average physician, last time I saw numbers, the average physician spends about $85,000 a year on staff, really good staff, who typically do nothing but manage the insurance industry. So that would pretty much go away. How do you recoup that? Well, that means if I have $85,000 less in office expenses, you can reduce my fee by $85,000 a year, and I come out whole. So you can recoup this. And then lastly, of course, the, you'd let Medicare negotiate the prices of drugs and devices. Now, that's a really important one because, number one, it's important, but number two, I told you that there were 25 studies that said we can afford this. In the, in the last year, there have been two studies, one from Emory University, I think it was, and one from the Urban Institute, that say that we can't afford it. And they said that if you look at them, they're flawed, and you can tell that they're flawed because they have no savings accounted for from things like better negotiation of drugs and devices. So if you're looking at a study and you're wondering about the conclusion, Look to see how much they said you save from drugs and devices. I don't know what the right number is. 25 studies, they all have a different number, but it's not zero. It's not zero. So Americans travel overseas. They travel overseas for health care, for really high-end health care, and they go to, to countries that are perfectly fine. But why are Americans going overseas for this care? This is a good story that taps into loyalty and sanctity. 750,000 Americans do that. Medicare means freedom of choice. So meet my mother-in-law. She has a rare cardiac condition. Uh, we decided that uh, she had to come to St. Louis to get treated for it. Medicare paid for it 100% of the way. Most physicians are in Medicare network. Now, suppose 
she had what I have. She had Cigna, and she had to go from Florida here. We wouldn't be in network. We wouldn't be in network. Medicare means she can go anywhere, and she doesn't like that to be changed. No. So how many physicians don't take Medicare? We all know that there are some, right? There's some. There's almost 700,000 physicians in practice in the United States today, and there's almost 10,000 who don't. So you'll hear people say, you know, thousands of physicians don't take Medicare today, and that's true, but hundreds of thousands of physicians do. In other words, 98% do, more than 98%. So Medicare means you can go to any doctor anywhere in the country just about, and you're in control. So what do we just do? I talked about feelings. I talked about facts. I talked about sanctity, and I talked about authority. So tap, what do we do here? Oh, I'm sorry, that's a duplicate. So last thing I wanna run through is healthcare a human right? This is, somebody asked about what are tough questions to answer, and this is one of the ones that comes up a lot. We love to say, yes, healthcare is a human right. It resonates with me. The World Health Organization uh, uh, says, yes, it says healthcare is a fundamental right of every human being. So what does everybody, what do conservatives say? Not, not so fast on that question. Where is healthcare as a human right in the United States Constitution? These are things I've had people say to me back when I used to be naive enough to say, to proclaim healthcare as a human right. Where's that in the Constitution of the United States? Where's that in the Bible, I've had people ask me. And some doctors will say, so my patients have a human right to wake me up whenever they want to? I've literally had these things brought back to me. You bring up healthcare as a human right, you put a line in the sand and say healthcare is a human right because it resonates with liberals and you drive people crazy. So what do you say? I'd say rather than focusing on the fairness and caring, tap into sanctity and loyalty. So here's one answer. I don't know if healthcare is a human right. I just know that it's a common good. It's a common good. Public sewage systems and trash pickup are also common goods. Those aren't human rights, but I want my neighbors to have their sewage drained out of their house. I want my neighbors to have trash pickup. These are public common goods. Is it a human right to have your sewage system? I don't know. I probably not, but I want everybody to have sewage connected. Um, or I don't know if it's a human right. I just feel a personal, a deep personal obligation to help those in need when I can. And if you don't feel that obligation, I'm sorry for you. So that's how I answer it. So to recap, how do you talk about, about moral values with conservatives? Don't shy away from it. Focus on loyalty. 750,000 Americans going overseas. Seniors love Medicare. Why can't all Americans have this? Um, stop letting insurance drain so much of our, oh, that's, that's not right. It's not 35, it's not of our economy, it's of our healthcare spend. Um, stifling wages uh, and sanctity. Um, I need the freedom to select my own doctors. Stop wasting my resources. So how do you get there? Do you just leap across the chasm or in one big step or do you do it strategically? This is a question someone asked and I don't know the answer to that. Uh, some folks who favor the leap, um, like Quentin Young from our, who passed away, but from our, our organization used to say that you, you can't cross a chasm in two steps, sort of an attractive, intuitive concept. You can't cross a chasm in two steps. On the other hand, you can say that I've looked at the bottom of those chasms, and there's a lot of dead people down there who tried to jump and failed. So you, you cross a chasm by shooting an arrow with a rope across, and then pull the rope, and then make it a bigger rope, and then make a, a, a rope bridge, and then a big bridge, and then drive a train. And I don't know the right answer, but that's one way to think about it. Um, people who favor an abrupt link will, will point out that all of the partial expansions that you can think of from lowering the age gradually, all of those partial expansions will get us there, but they are far less prudent. They're much more expensive. And if when we have the momentum to move forward, if it's really, this history has shown that when you're moving forward like that, you buy a partial solution and the country thinks, oh, we're done with that, thank goodness. And we move on. Partial solutions are less prudent and, they're, and, and they're, they're often really the road to failure. But, you know, so that's, so that's one of the arguments for an abrupt leap. The strategic incrementalism talks about being less disruptive to the economy. And I think Bernie's bill finds a good balance between those two polarities. Or the abrupt leap says if you're gonna fight, fight for what you really want. And the strategic, folk, strategic incremental folks say, let's at least be more feasible. Um, and that's it. That was a little bit longer winded than I expected to be. <laughs> so anybody can join our organization. You don't have to be a physician. Um, and we'd love to have you go to our website. Certainly follow us on Facebook and Twitter and all that fun stuff. And there's my personal email address if you have a question uh, directly for me. Well, this is awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I, gosh, I learned a lot. And I've been studying up on healthcare policy for 
about a year now. So that's uh, obviously I'm no expert at all, but it just, uh, I, it was very eye opening. So thank you so much, Ed. <clears throat> Um, we still have uh, 20 minutes left on our time and, and we can go longer if needed. I want to open this up for questions. Um, does anyone have questions that they'd like to put forward for Dr. Weisberg? You can unmute yourself. One. Yeah, please do. Awesome. Go ahead. Hey, um, this is Alex. My name is Alexandria Ocasio. I'm uh, running for Congress out here in New York City. So not exactly a conservative, but um, I am primarying a pretty centrist Democrat. Um, I'm happy to say that our campaign pressured Joseph Crowley into co-sponsoring Medicare for All. Um, so w that was a really big win for us, but um, I don't think he really has any intention of actually supporting the legislation once Democrats you know, have any kind of power juice in Congress. So my question is, um, what are the common arguments that you get from very like quote unquote pragmatic liberals or Democrats um, that are you know more centrist about Medicare for all and what are kind of the common rebuttals that you get so you know conservatives they tend to be very um, they tend to be very dramatic and like stark and blunt about their opposition but there's kind of this a little bit more pernicious opposition from Democrats that are more like, oh, you know, let's take it easy or let's look at the policy and kick the tires. So what, I'm curious as to like, what are the most effective rebuttals you've seen against that? And to also win people over. So usually, if you're talking about a centrist person, usually the issue is that they're um, really either misinformed or underinformed. And usually if you kind of listen to specifically what their concern is, usually you can just educate on them and get them and get them to come around. So, so the conservatives, you know, it, it was so, it was so widely misrepresented. The, the, those two studies that I mentioned that said that we can't afford it were so heavily promoted by during the presidential campaign um, that, that that's really gotten itself ingrained that the idea that we can't afford it. Um, and so that's one of the most important things when you're talking, if, if, that, if that's what they bring up, they say, you know, I, it sounds like a great idea, but, you know, I, I understand that we can't afford it. You know, we're, if they bring that up, then counter that with, you know, there are these two very flawed studies that have said that, but there are literally 25 studies that come to the opposite conclusion. And then if you need more granularity about that piece of it, uh, you can go to our, the PNHP website and there's the 25 studies are there and there's analyses of the two, but essentially the piece about, you know, for example, the negotiating power of the price of drugs and devices is, is, is an example of the flaw that really easily grasped a um, uh, sample of the flaw. So there's that. Um, there's uh, folks often say, well, it's a big, I, I think it's a pretty valid concern about the abrupt change, you know, changing one sixth of the economy. Um, I think that's a valid thing to be worried about. And so now you have a way to address that. You know, well, we don't have to do that. You know, let's have a thoughtful four-year transition. Um, so, you know, there, there, are, there are, I think if you kind of review the stuff we've talked about, you'll encounter the problems that are most common and you'll, and you'll have the answers um, right there to you. Great. Thank you so much. Ed, we have a question from the chat. Uh, and then this is from Judith, and she's asking, how do we help Medicare recipients feel comfortable uh, that their Medicare uh, is, is not going to change? Well, it, it will change because more people are in it, but uh, I'm sure that people are concerned that, uh, that their level of care may decrease as a result of that. So how do we reassure or discuss that uh, possibility with people who are currently on Medicare? That's a really important group to reach out to because there, anybody who would say that to you is, is apparently thinks that Medicare is really safe today, and they need to be, get aware of how the government, how the, I hate to say it, but partisan, but the Republicans are really attacking Medicare left and right. You know, as they as they pull people out of it, as they raise, they want to raise the age for it, they want to switch to a voucher program, all these things that they want to do, those corrode and erode Medicare as a program and actually threaten their ability to stay in the program. So the best way to make sure that they can stay in the program is what I was saying earlier, which is if everybody is in it, then they can't keep on messing with, with it. So I, I think the most important thing when you have a, a, 
I've got mine, I'm worried if you get into it, is to, is to deal with the, yours is in jeopardy today, and this is the best way to protect it. Another piece to look at uh, when you're talking to them is that part of them are thinking, well, my gosh, you know, you put everybody into this program, the healthcare delivery system is going to be profoundly overloaded, and, and I already have to wait, you know, 10 days to get in to see my whomever. Um, I, I uh, you know, I, I don't want to let more people in. So I probably wouldn't address the, the, the morally repugnant stance of that position, you know, that we're actually all human beings in this social mess together. I don't know that I would take that on, but I would instead maybe say, you know, that's not what actually has happened. You know, this has been programs like this have been implemented many times around the world. When it was implemented here in the United States, when Medicare was implemented here in the United States in 1965, that same fear was brought up. When Medicare, when, when healthcare was implemented in Canada, that same fear was brought up. People are rightfully worried about it, but as it turns out, that doesn't happen. As it turns out, in both here when we put our program in and Canada when they put their program in. The number of visits per year for the whole country stayed about the same. But what happened was that some of the ridiculously unnecessary um, procedures that we doctors are so good at drumming up business for, um, there wasn't much of a need for us to do that anymore because we were actually able to just spend our time dealing with the genuinely sick patients. So we know that a big chunk, a big chunk of um, what we do today is actually not necessary. And we know that physicians are spending 10, 12, 15 hours or more a week doing non-clinical administrative stuff. Physicians are spending lots of time not taking care of patients here, whereas in Canada, actually, the typical family physician, the only one that I have the data at my fingertips for, the typical family physician in Canada spends 2.4 hours per week on non-clinical administration. Here, 10, 15 hours, there, 2.4 hours. So right away, by switching to a much less bureaucratic system, you free up all of this extra physician time. You make doctors happier because we all hate that stuff. Um, so we're happier. We're working the same number of hours per week, but we're actually doing the stuff that we have a feeling of a calling for, seeing patients that we love to do. We can do that instead of this bureaucratic paperwork that's causing burnout among doctors and making them retire earlier. And, 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 so the, and, and if doctors are happier at their job in this way, then we have less early retirements. And again, the physician workforce gets a boost up too. So um, all in all, if you look at it, you know, it's, it's the best solution for that problem. It's not a, it's not a problem for, for current Medicare patients. It's a solution for current Medicare patients. And of course, you know, we're talking about improving the benefit design so that you don't have to keep on shopping every year for your supplement or worrying about which Part C plan to buy or worrying whether your Part D plan covers your drug this year, not last, not last year. All of that stuff goes away. All of those headaches go away. You can just focus on going to your doctor when you want to, getting your medications when you want to, and not worry about every year trying to pick, pick out the exact insurance plan to supplement your Medicare program with because you wouldn't need to. We'd fix it. We'd have improved Medicare. That's really, really helpful. Thank you, Ed. Um, Judith, I think you had a follow-up question, but I, I'm not sure that I follow the question. I apologize. Do we have any other questions for the group? So, so, so I have a follow-up question. Yes. So the follow-up question is that you mentioned two studies, Emory and the Urban Institute. And I see yes. Urban Institute appearing everywhere. And the Washington Post recent editorial, you know, in their editorial from four months ago, uh, the, the California Senate uh, used it and they're always described as a liberal think tank and they they ignored all savings and they have been rebutted twice and as far as I know they've never said oh yeah we should have added the savings in why if they're a liberal think tank do they stick with this thing that includes no savings at all yeah, you know, I'm not, I can't pretend to be at all intimate with, with how they work or, or, who, or who they are and why they did that. So um, I don't have an answer for you about why this allegedly liberal think tank so harpooned one of the premier issues for, for liberals. I don't, I don't have an answer for why, it's, why, for why that happened. I do have the answer for what you just said, though, and I, where I, you just said actually part of the, the important part in my mind is that, yes, we have really rock solid critiques of that study. Um, so we know that the data is false. Why, 
why this is still out there, why they did it in the first place, I'm, I have no insights beyond that. I'm sorry. I wonder too. Ed, Ed are those um, are those critiques that you just mentioned? Are those published on the PNHP website? Why, yes, they are. Well, then that would be really helpful. I'm sure for anybody who would be asked that question. I'm sure. <laughs> um, we have another yeah, question. I I'm sorry, go ahead. I gave you the very high level answer to what's wrong with those two studies. And yeah. because that's, you know, but there's, there's a lot more in the critique. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah. So we actually have a couple of questions uh, with respect to uh, veterans care. So Stephen in the chat says he's heard people say that uh, Medicare for all will result in closing the VA. And Mark, who is also a veteran, uh, says that uh, VA is separate. It involves TRICARE, essentially a socialist Medicare program <laughs> addressed by the, or used by the military. Um, can you uh, like just address questions about how Medicare for All would impact uh, current services that we provide for U.S. military, to your knowledge? Sure. Um, and I don't, I don't actually think there's enough granularity in either of the bills to give a, a substantive answer. But what, I, but what there is in both bills is an incredible level of support for a variety of delivery models. So, um, you know, it, it supports, it, it, I, uh, there's no reason that the VA structure as it is today couldn't be entirely compatible with the Medicare for All program. And I think that's a strategic, a, a strategic decision that the country would have to, would have to make. Um, the VA under Conyers bill, as I understand, as I remember it, I'm sorry, but it's not top of mind, but as I re remember it, the Conyers bill uh, doesn't roll the VA in very quickly at all. So there's time to be thoughtful about it. And I, I'm sorry, I don't know what Sanders bill says specifically about that, but, but philosophically, there's no barrier to going either direction. Um, and, you know, uh, the VA is enormously popular with, with many, many, many vets and it's a, and it gets actually good outcomes uh, in many ways, many important ways. So, you know, that would be a decision to have to be made, but I don't know any reason why you would have to do that. Well, I, I do know that the VA has been under fire quite a lot in the last few years because of um, wait times and things that <coughs> people, one of the common um, complaints that I hear from conservatives is that they, they don't want something that would be like the VA because of the problems that the VA has been experiencing. Um, but maybe you're saying that those uh, problems have actually been uh, exaggerated? Well, no, no. VA has huge service issues because, and I, I'm not expert at this. I probably shouldn't even make a comment about it. Um, gotcha. I actually, I should take my own advice and shut up. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So that, that's definitely something that we could probably explore um, further in, just in, in our research for this topic. Um, I had a, a, a couple of questions I jotted down. You mentioned in your presentation uh, how Medicare Part C and D do increase somewhat the administrative cost for, uh, for Medicare. Uh, do you know if that overhead would basically become irrelevant if we had Medicare for All? Meaning, does, does Medicare for All mean that those expansions are no longer needed or would they just become part of the system? There, there would be no market for a Part C or Part D plan. Who, who would want that? Because they would, everybody would have Medicare, hence Medicare for all. Everybody would have Medicare in part C, well, part D is a drug benefit. Well, everybody would already have a drug benefit, so there wouldn't be a market for that. And part C, the Medicare Advantage plans, the incredibly misnamed Medicare Advantage plans, um, give you a few more benefits, which actually most of those are embedded in Medicare for all. But what I don't think most folks realize is Medicare Advantage plans are essentially managed care. So traditional Medicare today, you can go to, like I said, more than 98% of physicians in the country. Medicare Advantage plans, no, you have a network. You have to ask them if your doctor and hospital are in network. So yeah, mm -hmm. the, the, those plans would, 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 would at, the point, at the point of implementation, those plans would have no market, you know, they'd be gone. So realistically, we could expect that the administrative cost would be on the lower end of what it currently is, as opposed oh, to Oh, right, higher. yeah, no, you wouldn't, right, yeah, you would not have the administrative, because the reason that those plans are more expensive is for the marketing and, the, and all the other things that I listed out earlier. That's why those plans are more expensive. Embed that benefit into the traditional plan, 
those costs don't come on, don't pass through with it. So yes, the, you you would be in the two percent range. You wouldn't be in the six percent range. Great. Um, Mark has another question. He's asking if we're not able to garner enough support in uh, 2018 or 2020, hopefully we will in 2018, but if we're not able to garner enough support uh, for Medicare for all, do you think it's uh, it's beneficial to propose passing a public option so that people can kind of dip their toes into that direction or would it be better to just continue to push hard for uh, for Medicare for all? Yeah, and that's where I was. I, try, I put up that slide that showed arguments on both sides of that equation. I mean, I, I do have a personal opinion about that, but um, the, I think I think the dominant opinion from um, our organization is that no, uh, fighting for uh, an incomplete solution like a like a public option would be abandoning a great window of of momentous change that we have before us, and and we should keep our focus on what we really actually want, which is the Medicare for All solution. Um, so I, I believe our organization would really push hard on, no, we should keep on, keep on, keep on target for that. If you did want to peel something off, if you did want to do a transition program that, that wasn't Medicare for all, there's one really obvious piece of very low hanging fruit that we could peel off and not be doing this compromise solution. And that's pharmacy. That's pharmacy. So you could with much less disruption to the economy, which is the biggest reason for a partial plan, you could empower Medicare to negotiate the prices of drugs and easily set up a system where those negotiated prices are not just not only available to Medicare patients, but are available to all Americans. And so I'm going to make a plug for a movie that you can you can get on um, online called Big Pharma Market Failure. Um, so, you know, use the Google machine and look up the movie Big Pharma Market Failure and uh, you can stream it. Um, and it was produced by a guy named Richard Master, who's a, a business owner. He paid for it um, on his own. And it makes the business case for, um, for letting the government negotiate the prices of drugs. It goes through why drug prices are so high today. It goes through why the free market has not been able to solve it. And it goes through basically the corrupting influence of money on politics, which is why the government hasn't solved it either. And then makes the case for how we could do it pretty, pretty straightforwardly. So, uh, I'm pushing a movie which I was consulted on in the development of, so you'll see me in it a little bit, but I was not paid. <laughs> it's just a completely pro bono. I have no conflict of interest on this. Um, so I recommend Big Farm Market Failure. Or his first movie from two years previous to that is called uh, Fix It, Healthcare at the Tipping Point. And you can also stream that. And that's more of a review of Medicare for All fr from a business perspective. Mm. Yeah, I watched Healthcare. At the, I watched uh, Fix It. Uh, couple of months ago and it was enormously helpful. I think it should be required viewing for every candidate. We concur. <laughs> All right, let's see. Uh, do we have another question in the chat room or online? Anyone? I just am writing you on. Can, can, so I've heard conservatives say that the U.S. is an engine of innovation and cutting edge because of capitalism, which I'm suspicious of. Um, it's my understanding that NIH gives a lot of grants and there's other federal grants which basically fund the basic research and the, the uh, and testing feasibility. And then this research gets handed off in some way to to uh, private, to, to industry and to, uh, to big hospitals, and then, and then it is monetized. So that wouldn't seem like it's capitalism, which is driving innovation. It would seem like taxpayers are, and then we're not getting a return. That's right. Um, and and I, think you, I think you've got it exa exactly right. So, there's a reason that we're, that we're in this situation of uh, balancing innovation and such in the way that you're talking about, um, because the current system is actually a solution to a problem that we had and no longer have. We fixed that, but we now have the consequences of that solution, and we need to do a better job at addressing that. We basically need to rebalance the mix between innovation and, 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 cost, and controlling the cost of drugs. So, 
the, the problem that we had was in the 1970s, up until 1981, um, NIH was funding this research, and there were, there were drugs that were ready to be turned into drugs, but they were sort of languishing on the shelves, and, and nobody was turning them into actual products. And then in 1981, I believe it was, a law was passed, which is still on the books, called the Bayh-Dole Act, B-A-Y-H and Dole uh, Act, um, and that said that if you're NIH-funded re researcher um, and you've developed essentially a drug, you can, you can personally patent that. That was not the case before 1981. You can personally patent that, that new drug and you can sell that patent. So as a consequence of that law, um, new drugs began to emerge much more quickly onto the market from this NIH-funded research. So it solved a problem. But the drafters of that bill knew that a possibility was that this would become a usuriously, um, this, this, this would be taken advantage of. And, and that's exactly what we've seen, right? We've seen, we've seen these drugs that were publicly funded research come to market. The one I just saw one a, a couple of weeks ago, $475,000 for a course of treatment. I mean, these prices are just, you know, unbelievable. Publicly funded things that we paid for that then are being privatized in a way and that, that's just untenable. But the, the, the drafters of this bill built into the bill that if the product is not being used in a way that serves the public good, the government can, the two words that are actually in the bill verbatim, the government can march in and prematurely terminate the patent. So if the drug that was that was developed in this way is not being used, it's not being marketed in a way that serves the public good, the government can early break the patent. That's currently the law. And so five times this has been tested. You have to make, anybody can make an appeal to the funding organization, according to the law, which is typically NIH. So anybody can make the appeal. Five times um, that appeal has been made. And each of those five times, NIH has said, well, we don't actually think the market price of the drug is relevant to the question of whether it's serving the public good. So elections matter. <laughs> elections matter. We, you know, we, we currently have the law to, to, to deal with this, and we just don't have the political will to do it. That's outrageous. Yeah, that's... It is. If you want to read another book that's really terrific about this, it's not got very much about Medicare for All, but it's got a lot about every other problem you can imagine in healthcare. Uh, it's a book that came out a couple of months ago by Elizabeth Rosenthal called An American Sickness. So Elizabeth Rosenthal, again, I have no interest in this financially. Elizabeth Rosenthal is um, a Harvard-trained internist, worked in the emergency department, was a New York Times journalist for the last several years. She's been the editor-in-chief of Kaiser Health News. And she came out with this book recently called An American Sickness, and it goes soup to nuts over virtually every problem in healthcare in the United States today, how it got the way it is, um, and what, uh, why it's the way it is, how it is like today. And more importantly, she does two more things. For every one of these problems, she gives tactical solutions for individuals wrestling with it as personal patients. You know, if you're in this situation from this problem, here's pragmatic, practical things you can personally do to work to manage it. And then even more importantly, here's the national public health policies that we need to put in place that would really fundamentally correct it. So it's, it's a brilliant piece of work and, and I recommend you reading it. She's pretty silent on the Medicare for All story in this book. Um, I'm not sure why, but, but so Elizabeth Rosenthal and American Sickness, I really recommend that book. All right. Do we have a few more minutes? Uh, well, we, we are about four minutes over right now. I don't mind staying on for a few minutes longer. It's up to Ed if you still have I'm fine. some time. Okay, good. Uh -huh. we'll, we'll keep going. On some of your grand rounds, you go into some detail about why physicians, why physicians support um, Medicare for All, comparing American and Canadian. And I've encountered a few physicians who say, oh, no, no. Medicare is harder to deal with than private insurance. No, no, no. I don't spend that much time with private insurance arguing things. I spend time with Medicare arguing with things. And, you know, I'm not going to pursue it because I don't want to harden them in their attitudes. But that seems strange to me. So the first part of the answer to that, of course, is 
there's a lot of things wrong with Medicare. You're completely right. Medicare is far from perfect. And I should have been saying, you know, again, don't, you know, but I should have been saying improve Medicare for all. And, and that's certainly one of the pieces. Um, but I'll bet that a lot of what you're dealing with, Dr. X, is not traditional Medicare. You're probably dealing with the Medicare Choice Program because that's managed care. That's managed care. And, and I mean, as a test case, I know, I know lots of folks with traditional Medicare and a supplement who don't have anything vaguely like that problem. And virtually everybody I know with Medicare Advantage finds it a disadvantage. And for that reason, actually, Medicare Advantage programs have, there's, there's really a ton of evidence that Medicare Advantage programs attract the healthier folks because, you know, there's all these extra benefits. So they, it attracts the healthier folks. But if the sicker you get, the more likely you are to switch out of a Medicare Advantage program and go back to your additional Medicare because those problems that you just brought up, all the, all the approvals and all the denials and all that, if you're healthy as a patient, you don't run into that too much. But the sicker you are, the more onerous that becomes. So that's why um, sicker patients leave these Medicare, and they want that, right? The Medicare Advantage programs don't want you if you're sick. They want you if you're healthy. So it's a perverse set of rewards. So physicians who say that they run into that are usually thinking about their Medicare Advantage plan patients and not their well, traditional patients. Distinguishing traditional Medicare and Medicare that has, that's controlled by private insurance. Correct. Yes, Correct. I don't even realize the difference exists. So there's that. But, but if it turns out that they're, you know, they're the odd bird that actually does really think that about traditional Medicare, um, two parts to that answer. The first, the first is that's why we're saying improved. And the second is I would, wonder if you're, I would wonder if that's not really what they're trying to say, if they're really just trying to make a rail against the government not getting to do anything right. And that's, that's a tougher one because, you know, it's more of a philosophic one. Um, that's one of the reasons to go for the, uh, for the you know, letting Medicare negotiate the prices of drugs to get a, you know, more under the belt of, yeah, of course we can do this right. Um, but there's a lot of things the government does right. But it's pretty hard to win that argument when that's their point of view. I've had that argument a million times. Okay, thank you. That's, that's good. Uh, the other piece I would say, if they, if they have the attitude that, that the government can't do anything right, I would say I, would, I, I then sometimes try to tap into the patriotism piece, the loyalty piece, because that's probably a conservative, and loyalty and patriotism are very important to them. And I just say quite out, quite, and because and this is the truth, I just say quite frankly, you know, I was brought up on Leave it to Beaver. I believe this is the best country in the world. I have strong confidence and faith in the United States, and it really annoys me when I hear people say that other countries are smarter or more creative or more able to solve problems like this because, god darn it, this is the United States of America, and we, of course, we're smart enough to fix that. Of course we are. So kind of, you know, take a little flag and wave it a bit for that guy. <laughs> I have kind of a... Because it's true. I didn't make that up. It's true, <laughs> you know. I think, I think, anyway, but I'm silly like that. I, I have kind of a short personal story about my own conversion on this topic, um, Ed, that, that's relevant to that point that you just made, which is that, uh, you know, years ago, I was a, a fairly conservative Republican voter, and I was locked in a, a healthcare debate with some friends of mine who were hardened socialists <laughs> from Canada and other countries that just really felt like you know, the, the whole American healthcare system was stupid, and, and I, was, I was on the opposite end of this argument uh, with them, and I, I made the, uh, I was much younger, I made the, <laughs> the traditional argument that, well, I wouldn't trust the American government to run a hot dog stand, and uh, my my friend responded, "Well, if the uh, if that hot dog run the hell out of it, <laughs> and, and that's you can't argue with that. I mean, you know, conservatives certainly are very um, enamored with the 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 strength and, and organization of our of our military, which is one of the the biggest uh, public expenditures that we have. So it's you can't argue that the government can't do anything right, and also think that the military is is uh, is well run." That's brilliant. I love that. Yeah. I'm going to keep that. <laughs> so, yeah, um, we have a, a comment um, <clears throat> about how the, uh, the talking about the, the breakout of talking between how to talk to liberals versus conservatives is super helpful. I actually had a note about that as well. I, I really thought that your, your help, your insight about how to 
frame your messaging using the four quadrants and uh, talking about start with listening. I, I think that's actually useful advice for, uh, for every issue, <laughs> for any candidate or any of us who are advocating for this policy to always start by listening to figure out who your audience is. That's a really, really good way to, to begin. And um, just this was incredibly helpful to me. Um, and I believe to everyone else as well. So thank you so much for your time, Ed. I just wanted to uh, recap, uh, you had mentioned a couple of books. So you mentioned uh, Jonathan Haidt, the, the Righteous Mind, for anybody who missed that, you want to jot that down. Jonathan Haidt, The Righteous Mind, and Elizabeth Rosenthal, An American Sickness. Uh, you also mentioned George Lakoff. He's uh, he's written quite a number of books and he's uh, he's, a prolific uh, author and and just brilliant guy on uh, how to message and uh, and frame your arguments in general. So it's good good information for anybody to check out anything that he's written. And also Ed mentioned a couple of documentaries: Big Pharma Market Failure. Uh, I have not seen that one. I'm definitely going to check it out and Fix It Healthcare at the Tipping Point, which I found incredibly helpful. So I, I would recommend uh, checking out both of those documentaries. <clears throat> um, one other question that I had, Ed, was you mentioned a white paper respect, with respect to the Senate bill. It talks about how we can possibly pay for it. Do you know uh, what's the title of that white paper, or could you share the link with us later? Um, yeah, I'll try to dig it back out and send it to you. I, 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 I do have it. Um, I, I can't remember the name of it, though. But, okay, um, no problem. I, 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 yeah, no problem. So I'll be sending out the recording link for this um, this meeting after it's ready. It's going to take some time to render, um, but we've also we're streaming this to our Facebook Live, so it will also be available on the uh, the for Brand New Congress Facebook page, and we will share that link with everyone. And uh, later we'll have it up on the Brand New Congress uh, YouTube page, and you'll be able to reutilize that recording for uh, for any purposes that you have. Uh, and we did have a couple of folks that could that asked about whether or not you would be comfortable making the slide deck available. I said I would have to ask you that. So don't want to put you on the spot, but it's, uh, that was one question that we did have. Sure. We, we tend to view um, PNHP slides as intellectual property. <laughs> so join okay. PNHP. It's really cheap. Join <laughs> PNHP and you get a, the double secret password and it gets you to the media page and you get uh, like a gazillion uh, slide decks, including, I don't know if this particular one is up, but if it's not and you remember, we can, I'd be glad to get it up there for you. There are, there's certainly a similar slide deck with this up on the PNHP website, but it's behind a it's behind a password. Okay, no worries, and and the the recording will certainly be available to everyone, so everyone will have this for their reference. So thank you so much. Uh, if we have no other questions, uh, we've run about 10, 12 minutes over now. So um, yeah, that's I will. I guess we can end it here. And thanks everyone so much for joining and thank you very much, Ed, for putting this together. This has been incredibly helpful. Thank you. Well, thank you. Love doing it. Okay. Bye. All right. Have a great night.